It is uh, Bruce. He's the group mascot. He's the group mascot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you don't. So so you so but you've managed to. So is that your home? You've managed to take the group mascot home with you, or you're in the office? Um, I'm uh, allowed. I was allowed to go to the office today. Just we... to pick up the mascot. Oh. Exactly. That's 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 all. Okay. Did you take Bruce from my office, Carsten? <laughs> I stole him already a week ago. You didn't notice. Oh, oh my God, there's a fight notice. breaking out already over the mascot. I think, I think <laughs> it should be like you have really No, 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 Nigel, mascot, mascot is uniquely Peter's thing. Like there's not going to be any uh, fight. Mascot, okay. Da, ba -bum, ba -bum. Ta -da. Okay, I think really, um, as we're waiting for people to join, if people are still joining quickly, um, I think what you need to do is you need to have it like in, um, in primary schools. You need to take it in turns with the mascot. You know, so it's Carsten's turn to take home the mascot and look after the mascot this week. And then maybe next week it's Peter's turn to have it and then so on. And you've got to learn to look after it, yeah? So it's kind of part of your growing. And what's the name of the mascot again? Bruce. Bruce. I think he even has a Twitter account. Bruce has a Twitter account. Yeah, he's not very active. Oh, the, well, Dasker's, Dasker's obviously Carson doesn't allow him anywhere near the computer. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so. I, but I, I don't even don't know who who runs the Twitter account. Uh, uh, it's also, I guess, less less popular than the Nigel's uh, shirt Twitter account. So. Uh huh. I don't know who runs that. I've got a feeling. I don't know. I don't know who runs my shirt Twitter account. My, sh my shirts do not. Um, this is a boring one, yeah? But anyway. Okay. Well, welcome, everybody. Suddenly, in the last minute, we just grained an extra 20 people. Uh, we are apparently now recording, so we're all ready to go. So, welcome to the second day of the virtual TPMPC for 2020. And um, I, it is my pleasure um, with a title like Legal Theorems of Privacy, legal and theorem in the same title along with privacy, um, we can only be blown away by Kobe's talk. So to, over to you. Okay, thank you, Nigel. And thanks to, you. Thanks to the organizing organizers for inviting me. Uh, yes, this title has a strange uh, this talk has a strange title and I'll try to explain it and maybe we'll get to legal theorems in the end. Uh, let me mention that this is part of an ongoing project with many people, uh, which uh, we started when I was at Harvard. I'm a, now I'm at Georgetown University and the specific results in this particular talk are with, uh, from a recent paper with Aloni Cohen that appeared uh, about a month ago at uh, PNAS. So let me see, why does this, oh, this is that, go. So we, <clears throat> uh, um, personal data is being collected and analyzed for many reasons. And one question we're asking is how to compute over this sensitive data while protecting individual privacy. And there are at least two kinds of answers you can uh, uh, give here. Um, so what does this mean, uh, protecting uh, with individual privacy? And I guess in a lot of the talks in this uh, workshop, the question is how to do that, like what cryptographic tools we could use to uh, protect privacy efficiently. But in this talk, I want to focus on the question of what it means to uh, protect individual privacy in terms of the functionalities that we're computing. Uh, and, and the reason this uh, fits uh, also the MPC agenda is that it's not just enough to uh, compute things securely. If what you're computing is not privacy preserving, then it doesn't matter how private and secure your uh, implementation is, uh, it will not uh, protect privacy. Now, trying to answer this uh, question, what does individual privacy mean and how we protect it? We have at least two kinds of literatures. One is uh, the uh, scientific literature, the computer science literature, 
And this literature has produced uh, some uh, technical concepts. Let me just mention two of them that I will uh, uh, run through uh, this, um, uh, this, this presentation. One is anonymity and the other is differential privacy. I'll explain both of them, both of them uh, very briefly in a few slides. When you look at this uh, uh, literature, it uses mathematical language and it attempts to offer general privacy protection and even uh, attempts to reason rigorously about these privacy guarantees. Rigorously here, I mean a way using mathematical language and being very precise. On the other hand, uh, we see uh, reference to uh, privacy also in, legal, in the legal literature, in particular in regulations and laws. Uh, this is just a small example. FERPA and HIPAA are regulations from the US. And there are probably uh, more than a thousand in the US that refer to uh, privacy. The GDPR is the EU General Data Protection Regulation. And when you look into these uh, documents, you see a plethora of uh, concepts related to privacy. Here I only picked a sample like PII, personal identifiable, and identifiable information is one that you uh, see a lot. Also the concepts of the identification or anonymization, but also linkability, singling out, inference, opt out, inference risk, and so on. Now, uh, these uh, documents are supposed to describe our uh, societal uh, expectations, societal needs. They are not formal from a mathematical standpoint. When you look at these uh, definitions, it's hard to figure out what the boundaries are. And sometimes they at least seem to be in disagreement with our current scientific knowledge. So kind of the privacy desiderata expressed in some of these documents is at least somewhat unrealistic. So trying to put these two pieces of the puzzle together, um, it's hard to fit them together. I don't know if you could see the animation. Um, and uh, this project is aimed at producing uh, a bridge between these uh, concepts, between the legal and, and the technical. So I will uh, not be able to, to show exactly how to bridge between the legal and technical. This is an ongoing open problem, but I hopefully will be able to show some direction and that there is some hope for doing so. So in this talk, I'll begin with some very short background. I will present these two uh, notions that came from computer science, anonymity and differential privacy. I was personally involved in the development of differential privacy. Uh, then we'll move to this question of uh, computer science and privacy law. And we will look into an example. This is the recent work with Aloni Cohen, where we are trying to formalize a concept from the GDPR, which is called singling out. And we'll have some time for summary and question and hopefully also coffee. So let me begin with this example, which is an attack that Tatania Suni did in uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, she used uh, a data set that was published in Massachusetts. This is the Group Commission, Insurance Commission data set. It included information about patients in Massachusetts. There were about, in uh, hospital and clinic encounters, there were about 100 attributes per encounter. And it was anonymized in the following sense that if you look at the record, then it would have a lot of information about the patient and what happened in a visit, but it will not have the patient's name, the patient's address and so on. What you can see here is some information that is related to the patient's demographics, like the zip code, the birth date and the sex. What Latanya did, was she went and uh, got hold of the voter registration of Cambridge, Massachusetts. These are public records. They are available to every uh, everyone. I think she had to pay 30 bucks to get that file. 
Uh, maybe today it's even, uh, uh, you can just get it on the internet. And if you look at the record in the voter registration, you see that this is not considered uh, sensitive information. It just has uh, names, addresses, so you can identify people, uh, party affiliation. And in particular, this also includes the address, like the zip code, it has a birth date in the sales of, of these uh, individuals. So when you join these two data sets together, there's a chance that you would uniquely identify some of the records in the JC data set. And this indeed happened. Uh, Sweden was able to re-identify the medical records of the, uh, who was then the governor of uh, Massachusetts. She put them in an envelope and sent it to his home address. And so that was an attack that got a lot of, a lot of um, publicity and rightfully, uh, it demonstrated that um, anonymizing data naively just doesn't work. You can re-identify a lot of the data. So a concept that was introduced to counter that is anonymity. This is by Samarata and Sweeney. And in anonymity, you take a data set and you make it anonymous, And you achieve that by suppressing information so that you make every combination of what you would think would be potentially identifying attributes. Every such combination should appear at least K times. So let me just show you an example. So this is a fake hospital data set. Uh, where you see names and addresses and social security numbers were erased, but they are still um, potentially identifying uh, uh, attributes here, like zip code, age, and sex. And these are the attributes that Latina uh, Sweeney used in her attack. But the disease is not considered identifying, so we are not going to uh, um, bother with it. And to uh, can anonymize the data. In this case, it's just to anonymize it. We suppress some of the information. Some of these operations are called generalization, doesn't matter for our purposes. But if you look here, you will see that the first and the last row have identical uh, quasi-identifiers, okay? So if my neighbor is from zip code 23456, I know that he is one of these, that one of these records is his, but I don't know whether he uh, had a heart disease or viral disease, okay? But people have then noticed that sometimes that does not really protect. In this case, uh, you cannot identify which row belongs to a person, but this is, the disease, the sensitive attribute is the same sensitive attribute, and this is called homogeneity attack. Um, and so you could ask whether anonymity provides privacy. Okay, this, this goal that we had, and there are some reason to think that it does. For instance, many regulations actually equate privacy and anonymity and anonymity is about anonymity. And it's an easy to understand, very intuitive concept and it forms linkage attacks. So at least there is one kind of attack that is uh, prevented here. But, and it's a big but, we have these attacks. I mentioned the homogeneity attacks. Uh, people also have uh, uh, shown background attacks and so on. And we've seen over the years, a variants of anonymity emerge like L diversity and T closeness and some others. But maybe even more seriously, if you take two, uh, if you take a data set and can anonymize it, uh, maybe independently twice, okay, and you publish both can anonymized data sets, then can anonymity is not necessarily preserved. This was shown in an early work by Gunther et al. and more recently in an attack on a specific data set by Aloni Cohen. So this. Uh, composition attack is something that is effective and can result in uh, loss of anonymity and loss of privacy. On the other hand, let me also uh, describe uh, differential privacy. Uh, this is uh, a concept that was introduced in 2006 by Dwork, McSherry, uh, myself, and Smith. 
And I will not need to, to know much about differential privacy for this talk. This is not a talk about differential privacy. It's just one of the concepts I want to introduce and, and, and to use. We say that the computation is differentially private if any information that is related to uh, information related risk to a person does not change significantly whether that person uh, his information is being included or not included in the analysis. Maybe for us, the, uh, the best way to think about it is using the real world, ideal world uh, uh, paradigm. In the real world, data is fed into a computation and we see an outcome. And this is a simplified uh, uh, setting, of course. Uh, this could happen several times and the, the, the computations could be adaptively chosen. I just simplified the picture here. And I'm worried about my privacy because my data is there in the data set. So the computation could leak something about me into the outcome. In my ideal world, the same would happen with my data excluded. Okay, if my data is excluded from the data set, then the computation cannot leak it into the outcome. And the facial privacy requires that the outcomes, the outcome distributions in both cases would be similar. And we have these two parameters, epsilon and delta that measure the similarity, okay? Unfortunately, we cannot have negligible uh, difference between the distributions as they scales our utility in the computation altogether. So kind of differential privacy or privacy forces us to think about um, computing, but when the error is not negligible. Okay, so a, epsilon has to be at, at least one over n actually. This is the difference between, uh, between the distributions. And this is the full uh, definition that again, I'm not going to need it, just that we see that we can write it uh, formally in mathematics. So we can um, ask this question again, as we asked about canonymity, does differential privacy provide privacy? And you could say clearly it does because we have privacy in the, in the name of this concept as we had anonymity in the name of the other concept, but this is not so convincing. We could name it otherwise. Um, well, it is based on a well-accepted definition of paradigm in cryptography. So cryptographers, I think, feel more uh, 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 confident about this concept. Uh, we can prove that it's robust to composition. So composition attacks don't um, apply to differential privacy, although the privacy guarantee deteriorates when you compose many analysis. And there is a growing acceptance certainly in the computer science uh, community, but also uh, there are implementations by the US census and the next census this year is supposed to use differential privacy computations, differentially private computations in, in its publications. And also Google, Apple, and Microsoft has, have implemented and used uh, differentially private computations in their systems. But if we try to match differential privacy with the legal concept, with the social data, um, because Differential privacy requires you to reason about math and probability. Uh, it's not very intuitive uh, and it's hard to understand by non-technical community. So uh, we don't really have the sense or it's hard to get a sense whether this concept actually provides the privacy that we seek in the um, legal uh, standards and also in, in the philosophical, ethical, uh, writing about privacy. So we uh, remain with this question whether anonymity and differential privacy provide privacy. I want to say that maybe this was not such a fair question because we did not say what this means, okay? Uh, and without actually saying what we mean by real world privacy by the societal uh, requirements, it's very hard to answer this question. So in the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to uh, take a, a step towards answering this and uh, by bridging between, uh, you know, technical and legal privacy concepts. 
I'll begin with some related work and then I'll run through an example. This is the uh, work with the Lonnie coin. So uh, there have been some uh, attempts to uh, connect between technical and in this case, philosophical thinking about privacy in, in particular in the framework of contextual integrity that Helen Nissenbaum introduced in 2004. Uh, this is a framework for reasoning about privacy as norms about information flows between contexts. So you see it's, it's a framework that involves both technical concept of information flow and a more uh, philosophical or societal concept, which is these norms. And there has been some work, uh, this is a paper by Bart et al, that uh, tried to take some of these principles from contextual integrity, the way that this framework helps or uh, reason about privacy, and to create a logic-based formalization of uh, privacy regulation from, the he from HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act in the US. In the US. So this is uh, about uh, medical information. A more recent uh, project is Robot Lawyers that is happening at Harvard by Altman et al. And here they use logic-based formalization of privacy regulations with the goal of automatic generation of human readable data use licenses. Uh, this uh, would work in a setting where um, research data is posted in a repository, but then uh, when researchers want to access it, depending on the data set and their users, there is going to be a license produced. And the goal here is to make sure that this license agrees with the privacy regulations and that it would be generated automatically. And both uh, works that I mentioned use logic-based formalization. And this formalization rely on predicates for determining, for instance, whether data is identifiable. But then how to instantiate this predicate? What does it mean? that data is identifiable, when is data not identifiable, this is left out of the framework. So if we want to push this further, we need to understand what concepts like identifiable, PII and so on mean in order to uh, uh, work with these uh, formalizations. Let me mention a little more related work. In an earlier uh, work in this, uh, in this uh, direction, um, uh, we looked at FERPA, which is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act in the US, and we extracted the mathematical definition of privacy from it. And the definition we extracted is probably much stronger than FERPA is asking for. So satisfying this definition likely satisfies the uh, FERPA requirements. Uh, but this is not a, probably not equivalent to the third power requirement. Uh, but at least it's a rigorous mathematical definition. And with it, we can provide a mathematical proof that differential privacy satisfies this requirement. And the last work I want to mention is a very recent work that was published in Eurocrip, I think just a week ago by Sanjam Shafi and. Uh, and uh, 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 Prashant, and they examine possible formalization of data deletion in the context of the right to be forgotten, and they use uh, the crypto real world ideal world paradigm in the attempts to create these definitions. And I think this is a very uh, interesting uh, direction. I hope we'll see more works uh, trying to do things like that in the future. So let me now show you what we did. Uh, the GDPR is the da General Data Protection Regulation. And if you want to the full title, you can see it here on the slide. Uh, it has repealed recently, uh, two years ago, the Data Protection Directive. Actually, this happened in um, May uh, 25th, uh, two years ago. So this is a happy birthday for the GDPR. 
And let's see what we can gain from it, what we can get from it. So beginning to read the, the GDPR, you encounter article one that kind of uh, draws the boundaries of this regulation. It says, this regulation lays down rules relating to the protection of natural persons with regard to the processing of personal data. Okay, so the regulation protects natural persons. This is a concept that I'm not going to uh, delve on, uh, but they protect a natural person with regard to the processing of personal data. If you have, if you hold personal data, if you control personal data and you process it, then this regulation applies. You may ask what personal data is, and in article four of the GDPR, uh, they say personal data means any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. An identifiable natural person is one who can be identified directly or indirectly. And I want to say that this is not so uh, unusual that you see the definitions that seem to eat their tails, but still there is, there is something here that we can use. We know that uh, we need to ask what um, uh, identified or identifiable natural person is in the data. Um, another part of the GDPR uh, is uh, a part that has recitals. They, these are uh, uh, kind of explanations of the articles which are supposed to be more operative if I understand correctly. And in uh, one of these recitals, recital 26 of the GDPR, they say, uh, they, 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 they give us a hint. They say, to determine whether a natural person is identifiable, account should be taken of all the means reasonably likely to be used, such as singling out to identify the natural person directly or indirectly. I want to say a few words about this. One is, uh, the, the, this recital speaks about um, uh, all the means reasonably to be likely to be used, but only mentions singling out. It does not mention ad other uh, means, uh, but you can understand, I think you can understand from the text that it is not intended to only speak about singling out. Another thing I want to say is that in the repeal data protective direction, there was also a similar result of 26 with a very similar text, except that uh, the text in the GDPR specifically mentioned singling out, whereas the text in the data protection directive did not. And so it seems that somebody thought that this is an important enough concept to include it in this definition in result 26. But what we can so far learn, hence, is that if you can single out in your data, then this is identifiable and hence you hold personal data. Okay, so uh, understanding singling out will help us understand what personal data is, although this is not going to be a sufficient uh, uh, condition, just like in a cell one. Now going forward, um, we wish we could continue this way and find in recital 724 an explanation of what singling out is, but uh, such a recital does not exist. And instead we refer to documents that were prepared by a working party that was set up by the Data Protection Directive. Now, uh, this uh, this uh, working party of uh, experts from Europe, from the uh, member states, it produced opinions, recommendations, and reports providing expert opinion, guidelines, and interpretations of the data protection directive requirements. It's not clear uh, to what extent the specific documents that we are examining here are relevant for the GDPR. And actually I do hope that the uh, body that replaced the Article 29 Working Party, the uh, European Data Protection Board um, will rethink some of these documents in particular the two that we were uh, relying on in this analysis. But anyway, what they say, uh, they say as regards indirectly identified or identifiable persons, 
This category typically relates to the phenomenon of unique combinations, whether small or large in size. So this suggests that you don't need to actually um, uh, uh, name a person in order to identify a person, but creating a unique combination is sufficient. And indeed they say a name may itself not be necessary in all cases to identify an individual. This may happen with other identifiers are used to single someone out. So what we can understand from this is that using a unique combination of attributes of a person, you can single that person out in the data. In another document, the uh, article 29 working party examines um, several uh, technologies with respect to risks. You see that singling out is one of three risks that they uh, that they examine. They also look at linkability and inference, but we are going to focus on the left hand of this, uh, of this table. And on the left column, you see the different technologies. You see that with respect to, sorry, uh, they say that chaonimity and similar L diversity and for the, for the purpose of this uh, presentation, they are, in, uh, they are the same. They ask whether singling out is still a risk and they answer a definite no. Uh, with respect to differential privacy, they say may not, okay? This may um, sound a bit strange to some of us that we think about differential privacy as a stronger concept with better math mathematical foundations than chaonimity and L diversity. And, but the working party was not so sure about the protection it gives you. So you can see that it says may not throughout the, the role of differential privacy. We'll revisit this table later on. So we're set to uh, examine what signaling out means and we'll try to, to uh, start from the GDPR as we, as we did and come up with hopefully a mathematical formulation that we would trust and hence we could trust, uh, we could check different uh, technologies with respect to this uh, mathematical definition. And here's a first trial. Uh, we found this in a paper by Francis et al from 2018. And they suggested the singling out is what we call isolation. We say you have singled out if there's an exactly one person that has these attributes. Okay, let me give you an example. So let's say this is a fake Netflix data set with only three users and the movies that they've seen, okay? You can try to isolate in this data set. For instance, there's exactly one row in this data that uh, contains the movie, The Sting, okay? So the person who saw The Sting is isolated in this data set and similarly, the person who watched Mulan between February 19th and March 10th is isolated in this data set. And also there's one person uh, that does not satisfy any of these two uh, descriptions. So a third way to isolate in the data set. So we could ask whether single, singling out and isolation are indeed the same thing. Should we uh, take isolation as the definition for singling out? And to do that, let me introduce a simplified setting for the problem, okay? We'll have a data set and we will, we will assume that the data set is drawn IID from some distribution uh, capital D. Now, uh, coming from cryptography, I don't like this assumption so much. I would be happier if we did not um, uh, need to have an underlying distribution. We don't know how to do that. And I'm going to refer to this problem later on in the talk when we will talk about conclusions from our analysis. So the data set is going to be fed into some computation. We'll call it a mechanism or analysis. And this computation M is also supposed to anonymize the data, okay, to prevent signaling out. So let Y be the published data. Y will be used by a singling out adversary and the adversary will output a description or we'll use the term predicate 
on the possible rows of the original data set. And the adversary would be successful if this predicate isolates in the data set, okay? That's the adversary's goal. And here's our definition attempt. We would say that the mechanism M is secure against signaling out if no adversary can isolate a row except with negligible probability over all the relevant randomness here. And this uh, seems uh, intuitive and, and, and appealing, except that when you examine it a little, you see that it's impossible to, to achieve, okay? Um, let me show you why. The reason is that you could isolate even without having any access to the data and to the published data Y. Okay, so let's remove this from the slide. I claim that the signaling out adversary A can still isolate with good probability. And just for an example, assume that X is a data set of 365 birth dates. Okay, then if the uh, adversary just chooses a data set born on October 23rd, then this actually uh, matches a one over th 365 fraction of the universe. Uh, we expect that only one person in the data set will have uh, this, uh, in expectation, there will be one person in the data set that uh, was born on this date. And if you do the math, you see that the probability of isolation is about one over E, which is 37%. So, even without getting any information about the data set and without the mechanism and its output, the singling out adversary uh, uh, succeeds with quite a high probability. And of course, this is something that we can uh, generalize. If you uh, can choose a predicate that matches about one over N fraction of the universe, then the probability of isolation is at least one over E or at least 37%. Now you may be worried that uh, I use here properties of the distribution and like I, uh, in this case, I knew that it's about birth dates and, uh, and this helped me create the predicate that matched one over N fraction of the universe, but maybe in general, this is hard but the answer, no, uh, we have tools. In particular, we can use the leftover hash lemma. And it suffices that the underlying distribution has moderate mean entropy. It, it has to be, has to have about log n uh, mean entropy. And in that case, we can generate uh, um, a, the predicate. So unless we are talking about really a dull uh, distribution that is not, it doesn't even have log n mean entropy, uh, we can uh, quite easily isolate in the data set. So uh, isolation enough is insufficient, but but reading through uh, the, the 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 legal. Uh, document, it seems that the isolation fits intuitively what, what they meant. So maybe we can try and, 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 and uh, modify this idea of isolation to get a concept that does make sense, okay? So let's ask what makes an isolation non-trivial? We saw an, a trivial isolation. And intuitively, in this case, born on a certain day in the day set of 365 birthday, this is a trivial kind of isolation. The attacker succeeds with high uh, probability, and this is doable even without access to the data. But if the attacker would succeed with much higher probability, let's say 99%, then this is something that is impossible to do without any, getting any access to the data. In this case, we could maybe blame the mechanism for the high uh, success rate, and that would be a non-trivial kind of isolation. And maybe even more interesting, if we have a predicate that is extremely, extremely unlikely, okay? And the attacker succeed even with a small probability, but not negligible, 
we would probably consider it non-trivial because we, with this description that is written here, we don't accept expect that there would even be a person where, that satisfies this uh, description. Um, if the attack succeeds, that this is really non-trivial. Okay, so. The conclusion of this very informal analysis on this slide is that if we have a significant improvement over some statistical baseline, and the baseline depends on rarity, then we can determine that the isolation is non-trivial. Okay, we can call that isolation non-trivial. So if we define the weight of a predicate to be uh, the probability that it returns one, we can define the statistical baseline uh, as a function of the weight and it's just this function. Uh, N is the number of rows in the data set, W is the weight uh, and E is E of course. And yeah, I wrote it here for you in this table. You see, uh, this is the case where the predicate has a weight about one over N and it results with about 37% uh, success probability. But if we look at predicates that have negligible weight, then the baseline is also negligible. And this is probably the most interesting regime uh, that we should look at. Actually, you may also uh, think that it's interesting to look at the other regime where the uh, weight is much larger than uh, one over N but I'm not going to do it in this talk. In, in the, in, in the uh, archive version of the paper, we'll also treat this regime. So now we are ready to make our definition. We call this predicate singling out to distinguish it from singling out, which is the concept that appears in the GDPR and also to allow others to uh, uh, suggest other variants of this singling out concept. And hopefully we could then compare them and choose the best one. Uh, we define the predicate singling out success probability uh, to be what is written here. That's a probability that, um, the, uh, that uh, the predicate P isolates uh, that, that A, sorry, that the singling out adversary outputs a predicate P that isolates in the data set, but also the weight of this predicate is bounded by W, okay? And we are going to generally set W to be negligible, okay? So uh, this is the definition we're going to use. Uh, M, the mechanism M is predicate singling out secure. If for all negligible weights, the success remains negligible. Okay, the success with respect to any uh, adversary. But you could also have a more general and parameterized definition that again, I'm not going to use. So I'm not going to get uh, into details here. Let me give you an example for a mechanism that satisfies the definition. This is a simple counting mechanism. We have the data set X and M sharp Q for a predicate Q counts how many elements in the data set satisfy this predicate, okay? Uh, here's a simple analysis showing that this is predicate single out secure. There are only uh, N plus one possible answers for this uh, mechanism, the, the value zero to N, okay? And the claim is that if we have a, a, an adversary that has high success probability, then the trivial adversary should also have high success probability. The reason is that the trivial adversary could just guess one of these n plus one possible answers, be correct with probability one over n. So the ratio between the success probabilities is about one over n. So this gives us that the success probability of our adversary A is at most n times the baseline, which remains negligible in this case. So this mechanism is predicate singling out secure. Another mechanism that we prove is predicate singling out secure is a mechanism where uh, we take the data set X, we apply a predicate Q to each of the elements. So Q of XI is a single bit and we publish that and this is also uh, PSO secure. One thing to note is that this definition is not the same as differential privacy. And in fact, differential privacy is not necessary for 
PSO security, uh, both mechanisms here are not differentially private because they are deterministic. And that cannot be, uh, and any differentially private mechanism is non-deterministic. Now that we have a definition, we can ask whether uh, this is a nice concept. We can ask whether, uh, in particular, whether it is uh, it self-composes. And in composition, we mean that we have L uh, mechanisms that are each individually PSO secure. If we look them at them as a joint mechanism, does uh, PSO security still is it still preserved? And let me show very briefly this theorem that uh, uh, PSO security fails to self-compose, okay? And we're going to use our count queries here. This is my data set, and I assume that it was generated uniformly at random. I have n columns and l rows here. And I'm going to uh, create uh, l plus one counting mechanisms here and in the following way. The first counting mechanism, I'm choosing for the first one, I'm choosing a predicate that has weight about one over N. So with probability about one over E, this identif this predicate actually identifies a row in the data set. So if I got a one there, I was successful. The, if the count is, is one, and that would happen with 37% uh, 7, of the time. Okay, if I was successful in doing that, then I can now uh, try to isolate uh, the entire row, actually to learn the value in the entire row. The, I will ask the following query. Uh, Q1 is uh, Q0, which identified this row and whether the first bit of this row is one and so on. So I learned the first bit, the second bit, all the bits in the row and I learned a super logarithmic number of bits here. So the, the, the weight of this predicate that I learned is negligible. This is the predicate that I'm going to output. So that's a successful isolation if I've access to this L plus one counting mechanisms. Uh, this suggests maybe that there is an inherent issue with the concept of singling out because counting queries are very common and natural and likely they would be allowed by any interpretation of the concept. Um, we can also show that if you take uh, that there exist two mechanisms that you put them together and composition uh, breaks and, 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 and PSL security breaks, but I don't have time to go through that. So I'm going to skip this. Now we're back to this question, but you see that I substituted privacy for uh, GDP, uh, GDPR anonymity for privacy. So this is at least one aspect of the question of whether anonymity and differential privacy satisfy this regulatory requirement for privacy. With differential privacy, actually a simple theorem shows that yes, uh, differential privacy does protect against predicate singing out. Don't try reading all the uh, Greek letters on the screen. Um, the interesting part is that this is via a connection uh, to uh, the generalization properties of differential privacy, something that has been in research since this paper of uh, Dwork et al in uh, Stock 2015. And we're using a variant of, 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 of uh, these results in proving this theorem. With respect to canonymity, uh, we show that canonymity does not uh, protect against predicate singling out. And actually, typically, canonymity would help the adversary do the hard work in a predicate singling out. So let's look at this data set and let's assume it was three anonymized. So every color here is corresponds to three records that have identical uh, pattern, okay? Um, now, because canonymizers try, uh, so a simple observation is that the canonymizer actually, we can look at the description of a row as a predicate and this predicate satisfies uh, is satisfied on uh, K over N elements or more in the data set. Okay, so it's not an isolation yet, but uh, these predicates usually 
because scalability algorithms try to preserve as much information as they can with the data, usually the weight of these predicates is going to be tiny or negligible. Okay, so maybe we can use such predicate in order to uh, single out. Uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, we can just choose a trivial predicate with y, a weight about one over k and compose it with one of the predicates we're learning from the k anonymizer, in this case with phi one. Clearly the weight of this predicate will only uh, become smaller, so it remains negligible. But because we're using the trivial uh, predicate among with weight one over k among k elements, then the overall uh, isolation probability is going to be 37%. Uh, okay, so that's the construction here. So uh, K-anonymity actually helped us isolate in the data set in this case. Now we will try to claim why, why legal theorems in the title, we are trying to claim that these have implication, uh, legal implications for GDPR compliance. Now there's a caveat, this notion, as I said, it may, it, it's not the ideal one. Um, in particular, we have this uh, problem that we assume that the data is drawn IID from some underlying distribution and we are seeing also don't take into account auxiliary knowledge that an attacker may have. And it may be that the uh, regulators wanted us to take auxiliary knowledge and also consider more complex data sets than those that are uh, created by uh, choosing ID from some underlying distribution. So this means that the negative results we have are more legally meaningful. We have a restricted scope here and hence, this only strengthens the negative results. Intuitively, uh, satisfying predicates in and out is necessary for satisfying the GDPR notion of singling out. And this suggests that canonymity quite likely doesn't provide sufficient protection against the GDPR singling out. This is from our analysis. On the other hand, the positive results have restricted the implication because as I said, preventing these attacks is necessary, but may not be sufficient. And in particular, we cannot get to a conclusion with respect to differential privacy, and this requires further analysis. Back to this table of the Article 29 Working Party Assessment, we hope that when the European Data Protection Board will reassemble and think about these documents, they will reconsider these conclusions would they have in the table with respect to canonymity and diversity. Well, let me just conclude. Uh, what we've seen is an exercise where we started with a technical concept and with a legal concept, sorry, from the GDPR, we generated a technical concept that we could analyze, formalize and analyze, and then we went back to ask what, how this technical analysis affects our understanding of the legal concept. In more detail, we started with GDPR notion of singling out. We generated the definition of PSO security. On the way, we also ruled out one definition that uh, did not seem to make sense. Then once we had a definition, a mathematical definition, we could treat it as a mathematical object and ask questions about it. In particular, we asked, whether it composes of well or, or, or not. And we proved that uh, this notion of, of security does not compose. And a result of this understanding is th there may be an issue with the GDPR singling out security uh, uh, notion of, uh, the GDPR notion of singling out and probably it does not compose, does not necessarily mean that it's a bad concept but probably suggests that it is an insufficient concept by itself. It's something that you would want to uh, add other concepts to, uh, other requirements to. Then we uh, show that canonymization is not PSO secure. And we think this has legal uh, uh, meaning that canonymization likely does not prevent the GDPR singling out. With differential privacy, it is uh, predicating out secure. 
it only gives some evidence that it does prevent the uh, GDPR singling out uh, requirement, uh, and, uh, prevent the, the, the notion of singling out under the GDPR, but we still need to, uh, uh, we, we need more work here. And it would be interesting if we can, as a next step, uh, begin with the definition of peace of security and suggest to uh, uh, the uh, European Data Protection Board uh, how to write a legal concept of uh, singling out, which is based on our analysis. Let me just conclude with this slide and say we're not there yet. There's a lot of work to be done. In this work, we started from a legal uh, concept and we formulated a technical concept. I think there's a lot to be done also in going in the other direction. And maybe the last word I want to say, the fact that we analyze the GDPR and concept in it does not mean that we uh, always endorse these concepts, but realize that these are concepts we have to live with and we need to find the best meaning for them uh, in order for this, for the GDPR and hopefully also other regulations to uh, uh, make sense and to bring us to a world where we have better personal privacy. Thank you. Okay, um, whilst we, oh, I'm off, yeah, I'm off mute. Um, we await to see if anyone types some uh, questions in. We've got about five minutes for questions until the next talk, um, if need be. Um, I've got some questions. So. Have you engaged with lawyers or people to, exp uh, to understand whether they want to adapt their definitions, especially like you said that the, this article 29, 29 I think it was, uh, needed to be updated. Have you talked to people who are doing that or not? So certainly uh, we have lawyers in the team uh, working on this, um, but uh, so far, uh, we have not, we had very little communication with uh, the European uh, uh, authorities and lawyers in, in, in Europe with respect to this uh, project, but this is definitely an important next step for us um, to try to get to the right people with uh, an explanation of these uh, um, explanation of these results. We're currently also writing a paper which is much less technical and um, which tries to explain this approach in, in a way that I hope will be more accessible to uh, the legal readers. And I hope that will you know be, be a start starting point for a, a fruitful discussion with them. Okay. You might want to uh, reach out. There's someone in, uh, I think UCL or Imperial, I can't remember. I'm checking up here. I'm not, not sure which. Called Michael Vila, and he yeah, does. You've talked him. Yeah. talk to him, so you know him. And he's then linked him with the um, European Commission, so he might be able to help you there. Okay, we have one question here. Um, from this is a question from Amos Trager. Um, is um, the question is in the legal documents that you examined, did you find further terms or concepts that be could, that could be connected? to other crypto techniques like MPC, MPC, or do these techniques and legal concepts just seem too different? That's a great question. Uh, so uh, we were also starting to look at concepts related to distribution and MPC. Um, in the specific documents that I've looked at so far, there hasn't been much uh, with respect to this. Uh, like uh, distribution, definitely raises a lot of questions that have not been directly um, treated in the legal um, in the legal literature. For instance, uh, questions of who holds the data, who owns the data, and so on. Um, and I think it's going to be a fascinating uh, question to look at and try to answer um, how, 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 to, how to bridge between uh, the concepts, or whether uh, hopefully there are some concepts in, in the legal world that, that, that would shed light on this. And it also may be a place where we as a community could work together and think how we suggest the right concepts for the legal uh, community to include in, in, in the regulations. Cool. Okay. I think that's all the questions. So let's um, thank Kobe again. Round of applause from. 
virtual people. Okay, and 